Thank you for the opportunity to interview you. Right now, Greece is the, the hot, hot problem of the European uh, economy. German economy saved the euro area economy to enter in a new depression, but we can clearly see a two-speed Europe. How long it will take to see a dismantling of Eurozone? I do not ex expect the Eurozone to be dismantled, actually. I think that our uh, political leaders will do everything that is in their power to preserve the Eurozone as much as possible, even if it might mean that uh, uh, Greece would no longer be part of the, the Euro system. Uh, now, the, the discussion right now is, is a discussion that is uh, being led in, in Germany, but also elsewhere, as uh, many commentators on the financial markets uh, raised the question, well, how could uh, Greece uh, leave the Eurozone? How could uh, Greece get out of the Euro? Now, uh, we need to be clear of, uh, about what this would mean technically. I mean, technically, uh, it's not because uh, the, Greece the Greek authorities, uh, central bank representatives or government representatives, would no longer sit in the Council of Governors of the European Central Bank, that therefore, all by itself, uh, Greek Greece would leave the Eurozone. And, for example, you have countries such as Macedonia that use the euro and they are not represented uh, on the governing council of the European Central Bank. So it's not because uh, uh, there's a political decision to oust Greek representatives from the Council of Governors that therefore, uh, first of all, Greek citizens, Greek firms would uh, stop using the euro. This is not, uh, not at all the same thing. And secondly, even if they did stop using the euro and if they converted all uh, euro banknotes and euro deposits into a new currency, a new drachma or something like this, uh, this would not stop the financial problems that we currently have because we, it would still be the case that lots of the liabilities of Greek banks and, and Greek, uh, of the Greek government would be held as assets by Western European banks and Western European insurance companies. So we would still have the problem. But... Uh... Greece is, is not the only problem. There are Portugal, there are Spain, also Italy. Yes. So what is the magic? Well, the, it's actually, there's not magic. I mean, the, the, from a mechanical point of view, it's, uh, it's ultimately it's very easy. There are two solutions, two ways out of this, this crisis. Either you uh, go through an adjustment crisis, that is, there's an aggravation of the present situation. You uh, allow that banks go bankrupt, uh, that governments default. And this, of course, would uh, entail more or less immediately. Even the thought that this, or the, the, uh, the, the idea that this might be a political reality would more or less entail immediately a collapse of uh, banks, insurance companies, investment funds, and so on, all over the world, not only in Europe, also in the United States, also in, uh, in Japan. And so this would be the consequence. And it's not necessarily a consequence that we should rule out from the outset because it it's would be a very hard, very harsh uh, event. It may be, and I personally think that this is, uh, this is what would have to be done in order to cleanse the market from the uh, previous excesses and uh, reboot the economy on a more sound basis. Because the great thing that you get through a, a, a collapse is that all debts are being wiped out. And so then you... Uh, make it impossible that the new credits be, be granted in the short run. And so the economy, the banks, and uh, other financial market participants, but also companies, would have to finance themselves on a greater, to a greater extent by equity, not by debt. The second solution, and there's only this other second solution, the second solution is to um, bail out as many market participants as is necessary to get through the crisis. And this bailing out can occur directly by in injecting uh, public funds in the form of equity capital into the uh, banks that have difficulties or subsidizing governments that cannot uh, equilibrate their budgets. And because there are not, not enough uh, savings there to, to finance all of this, it would have to be financed out of the printing press. And there is no third solution. But it, it, it is the second scenario possible right now because uh, uh, European Central Bank uh, uh, in, in December and February, the European Central Bank uh, uh, pumped something like one trillion yes. euros, and uh, in yes. and in three three months, the, this money have already gone. The, the, the yes. Yeah. 
the governmental bond. bond well, if you, it's, it's true, right? So the, um, that's what we call the base money supply, the, the, the money supply that is being created by the euro system. That has increased dramatically. And of course, in, 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 uh, at, at when, when the time comes, it would also increase uh, the, the price level. But so far, it has neutralized a simultaneous decrease of uh, money being created by banks. Right? So the money supply has these two main pillars, or maybe two main components. One is the base money supply that is being created by central banks. The other pillar is uh, the, the, the bank money supply, so the, the deposits being created by banks. And that has actually not expanded. It actually has shrunk. So what the, what the uh, euro system did was to neutralize partly uh, that part of the uh, money supply that normally would have been created by banks, but is no longer created by banks. So there is no immediate danger of inflation, of course. Right? To the extent that the situation normalizes itself, there is a big, big danger of inflation. And but it will come. But what about the balance sheet of the European Central Bank? It's, it's very bad, yeah. It's, it's, it's a problem. We've been discussing a few years back, we've been discussing about bad banks, right? And we've been decrying hedge funds. Now, I mean, the current joke on the financial markets is, well, the European Central Bank is the biggest hedge fund of the world. That's probably correct. Maybe with the exception of the Bank of England, which is in a similar position. Don't you see a possibility that the Eurozone will, will dismantle something similar to what you describe in your book, in your, your biography of, of Mises, uh, the political disintegration of, uh, of uh, Hamburg Empire mm -hmm. and the, their problem with the currencies, with mm -hmm. the stamping and so on? It's, it's, it's a technical possibility, so we cannot rule it out completely. But I mean, today the situation is very different from the situation which Austria-Hungary found itself in 1918 and 1919. At the time, the uh, centrifugal forces, political forces, were dominant. So they had very great uh, difficulties of holding the country together already before World War II. Uh, one. Right? So the, the Czechs wanted to secede. There were very strong forces of secession within Hungary. And then, then other parts of the empire wanted to secede as well. And, in, and the war had only exacerbated the, these movements had reinforced them, and so it was a natural consequence that the, the, the empire fell apart. That's not the situation, I would even say not at all the situation in which we find ourselves today. Look at countries uh, such as uh, Germany. Germany is uh, the, the main uh, financier of, of the European Union uh, right now. And in Germany, the pro-European Union sentiment is still very strong, very, very strong. And in the other countries as well, they are having difficulties in Greece. I mean, the, the Greeks do not want to opt out of the European Union. Right? There have been elections uh, right now, and the new parties that have been swept into parliament, they, are, they do not want to secede from the European Union. Right? They, just, they, they have what I think are erroneous opinions about the options that are available uh, to them, the political options, but they, they want to stay within the Union. And, apparently wish to receive more subsidies, and that's not going to happen. So I wouldn't rule it out, right? I wouldn't rule it out in a, in a horizon of, let's say, five years or 10 years. But for this to happen, you would have to have a major change in public opinion, which, which can happen under the impact of an aggravation of the crisis. And if we had indeed, for example, now we, we permitted a strong uh, deflation, uh, so a, a collapse of the financial market, very strong difficulties for the rest of the economy, this might uh, have a very sobering uh, effect on the attitude of many Europeans toward the European Union, and it might entail then the wish to leave the European Union. Alan Meltzer has a proposal, you know, regarding the solving of the of the euro crisis. He advances the, the idea of creation of two two currency unions. One. No, northern currency unions and the southern currency unions who eventually devalue the, 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 their currency and uh, solve the fiscal budgetary problems of, of that mm -hmm. state. What, what's your opinion about, about this? Yeah, is again, it? yeah, I, I think that technically, of course, that it's possible to do this, but it wouldn't solve any of the short-run problems that we have. Right? The short-run problems spring from the fact that uh, financial market participants are interdependent it's not because you, you create a northern euro and a southern euro that there is no more uh, debt uh, relationship between uh, northern banks and southern uh, users of credit, uh, southern debt debtors, right? 
So you would still have this. And so the, the simple introduction of a new currency all by itself doesn't solve these problems. Then of course you might say, okay, then we have a currency reform, then we uh, devalue. Right? But then of course you create the crisis. Right now there is a growing consensus in mainstream me media and the mainstream economics profession that austerity doesn't work because it's hampering uh, growth and some form of stimulus fiscal or monetary is necessary. What will be the result of the renaissance of this old Keynesian's view, point of view? Well, I mean, we will be wasting even more capital than we have done so in the, in the past uh, 76 years already since Keynes published his book. I mean, again, right, we, we have uh, uh, the, the entire s second part of, of the century, we didn't have actually a very d dynamic uh, economy. I mean, uh, it had been s uh, some uh, decent growth rates in Western Europe in the 1950s and 1960s. In the 1950s was by and large reconstruction uh, after, after World War II, because the economy at World War II was at about 50% of, of its uh, level uh, of 1928. Right? So there was lots of infrastructure, lots of uh, uh, grow, uh, increasing returns that we could rely on. And then there was uh, were some liberal reforms. We, we created a common market uh, in the end of the 1950s, so we had good growth rates. But by and large, uh, we, we had during all this time, we had a growing ascendancy of uh, Keynesian ideas, and according to Keynesian ideas, what, what drives the economy is consumer spending. That was the main justification for having government also spend a lot of money, because that was considered to be a contribution to economic growth. And what we did all the time was actually to waste a lot of capital. Now, uh, we've been wasting a lot of capital, but it had been neutralized by other uh, forces that truly created more growth, so we had greater international integration, a stronger division of labor. We had very strong technological progress, uh, especially in the past 30 years. Uh, we had the disintegration of the Soviet Union, which even further increased the, uh, the international division of labor. We had more and more affluence, uh, not only in, in Western Europe and in Northern America, but also in other parts of the world, which increased savings, right, and partly compensated for this. But still, right, all these spending programs, all that the government did was partly offset these forces that should have given us way uh, stronger growth rates than we actually had. If you think of the circumstances that we were reunited in the 1980s and 1990s and even the past 10 years, we should have had almost double digit growth rates. And that's what we had in Germany in, in the 1880s and 1890s, right, benefiting from the same set of circumstances, increase of the division of labor and technological uh, breakthroughs. Uh, we had very strong growth rates, same thing in the United States. And we didn't have it because we were simultaneously, this time we didn't have it because we were simultaneously wasting a lot of money. Now, when you are still rich, and while the other forces are strong enough to overcompensate this, I mean, you, you're doing why not fine. But right now, we are on the edge. So Keynesian policies apply, Keynesian policies are precisely the things that you shouldn't do when the economy is, is in a crisis and when it risks degenerating. So then it actually should do the opposite. What we're doing now is to impoverish our growth potential for the next 20 to 30 years. But what, what, what is your contra-argument to the phrase austerity doesn't work essentially right now in, 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 in the actual context? Well, it, de you know? it depends on what you mean by it doesn't work. If the objective is to save companies and save governments on the brink of default, then it's true, austerity doesn't work. Austerity increases these very problems in the short run. But that's what you need. In order to get through this, you first need to, you need a lot of defaults. Because what we have right now, we have an enormous amount of debt that cannot possibly be paid back. It's just out of the question. All right, so what you need in order to reboot the economy and give it a new uh, boost is to get rid of a lot of, of uh, this debt. This would also allow to reduce uh, ta taxation and, and similar things. Uh, so that's what, what needs to be done. But of course, the price for this is that you get massive bankruptcies in the short run, that you get very high unemployment. Unemployment could easily be 30, 40 percent, at least for a couple of months. So and who is, where's the political leader who is ready to pay this price and, and explain those policies to the population? And don't forget deflation because... Yeah, so deflation would of course be the, the, the vehicle, right? Would be the mechanism of this, of this process. Right? Last year, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Juncker was, was uh, quoted, widely quoted as saying that, well, we all know what to do, but we do not know how to get re-elected once we've done it. 
which is, of course, I mean, this is perfectly correct, but it's also a very cynical way of, of looking at things. I mean, I, I think well, as, as a political leader, that's precisely your, your duty. It's not just to be re-elected. That shouldn't be your first objective. Your first objective should, should be to make the right choices and create majorities for what is ultimately in the long run interest of a country. Um, that's, an, that's an interesting problem because um, uh, we, we are talking about politicians actually in office right now who want, uh, who all want to be re-elected. Uh, and uh, those few politicians who, who are for what you call the right measures, but the painful measures to, to overcome the crisis, uh, are, uh, are having uh, big difficulties in being elected. For example, the, the most successful example is Ron Paul, and he's at, let's say, 15%. So my question would be, how, uh, how can you sell the right policies to the, uh, to the voters? In, in, order, in order for uh, those politicians to actually get in the office and, and do it. I recognize this is a very big problem. Of course, especially if all your competitors are trying to lure them into the easy way, the short run easy way, but ultimately running into disaster in the long run. But so I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to this. I think Ron Paul is doing a fantastic job and he might not uh, obtain a majority this time, but he is definitely creating uh, the conditions for, for spreading correct ideas about the working of the economy in, 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 within the next generation. So even if it doesn't work this time, the conditions are very favorable and increasingly become favorable for uh, 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 steering the economy uh, in American politics in general away from the disastrous uh, path that it has taken right now. Right, so, but I mean, there's a division of labor. <laughs> I'm an economist. Right? I, my, my main job right now is not even to be original. It's just to state the, the truth. I mean, just say how things are. And it's the job of politicians. I mean, that's what they are up to. Right? Uh, isn't it a little people. bit frustrating for you <laughs> ju ju uh, uh, just to uh, speak and write about what what uh, uh, it has to be? It has to be done at the political level. Mm. But uh, uh, very uh, very few politicians actually believe in in all of it and uh, mm. would be ready to, would be ready to implement it. In yeah, that, that, that's true. But who will be the ne next Trump poll? Who will be the next Ron Paul? Yeah. Who, who will take over? Well, Ron Paul is an individual, right? I mean, you should not try to imitate another individual and be a clone or but something. Who, who, who will benefit for, from the Ron Paul movement? Ron well, I Paul. think his, of course his son, right, is, is very well positioned to, to be a, the leader of the movement that has been initiated by his father. So it might very well be that, that Ron Paul be become a president of the United States in, in 20 years or something. It's, it's very well imaginable, even earlier than that, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, he, for us here in Europe, that, that's, uh, of course, that that's also would be relevant because uh, if the United States had a president, a libertarian president that led the country in this sort of direction, it would create very strong uh, impact on uh, the climate of opinion in Europe as well. So many more people would become interested in this. But ultimately, our problem is to find uh, and promote such leaders ourselves, identify people who have the courage uh, to do this. And the first, I think, uh, the, given the way politics works, uh, politicians, in a way, are executioners, right? A politician is not uh, necessarily a, a visionary, a leader of a movement uh, that he himself creates through his ideas. It's somebody who takes the leadership of a dormant or latent movement that is ready to be led into the direction uh, indicated by its ideas. Indeed. So what we, what we need to, I think, what our first task now is to spread uh, correct ideas about uh, the role of government that government might have in the economy and things, especially things that it cannot do, uh, because there are lots of illusions about, uh, about this question. And as soon as a sufficient number of, of people have understood these ideas, there will be politicians uh, who espouse the same agenda and uh, will be elected by such people. Did you see such a movement in Europe and or such a leader who can... Well, I mean, there are... Um, there, ever once in a while, so there's no European Ron Paul, right? at least to, to my knowledge. Uh, but there are, you have politicians from, uh, who at least come close. For example, Václav Klaus in, in the Czech Republic is fairly close. 
and he has his constituency in the Czech Republic. It is no accident that he has been elected president. Uh, and uh, he's, he's isolated within the chiefs of state within the European Union because he's the only one uh, of this sort. And in other countries, you have, you, have, you have small, for example, in Germany, we have uh, one member of parliament, this is um, uh, Scheffler. Scheffler is, is, is pretty much inspired by Van Ron Paul. Uh, is, is much weaker, but he has Ron, he's seen the example given by Ron Paul, which he started off very low, low level, right, and has created a movement in the course of 40 years. So this is an inspiring example for somebody who has the breath, right, and the, the, the stomach, right, to go a long way, and that's what you need to do. If you're just out for short-run success, and if you do not really care for your country, if you don't love your country more than yourself, uh, more than your short-run interest, but you will not create such a movement. What do you think that will be the future of the legal monopoly represented by the rating agency? Right now, rating agencies are heavily criticized by European politicians, not for their failure to predict uh, the subprime crisis, but uh, for downgrading the ratings of uh, Eurozone countries in times of sovereign crisis, you know. <laughs> And the actual fiat money system is based on the activity of this agency because the central banks accept that as collateral only the, the AAA, theory, theoretically, mm -hmm. only the AAA uh, bonds uh, uh, of the sovereign governments. What do you think about this? Well, I mean, the, strictly speaking, rating agencies are not necessary for, for the operation of the fiat money system. They are necessary for the government to channel more savings into government bonds than they would otherwise obtain. It's, 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 a, it's an interventionist uh, way of uh, forcing insurance uh, companies, especially, but also banks, to hold more government bonds than they otherwise would, because the law obliges them to do this. Right? Uh, how do I see the future of, of the monopoly? I mean, the, the monopoly has already been crumbling, right? I mean, uh, in the past 10 years. Until uh, 2000, approximately, there were only the three main American rating agencies. And ever since we're there, I mean, right now, there are about 10 or 12 in the market. Uh, and uh, so there, there are more options to choose from. But I mean, uh, in, then there are thoughts, uh, especially in France, but in other countries as well, should we create a European um, but one European, yeah, one, one one European, European. rating agency <laughs> that gives us the correct ratings, yeah. those, those that please us. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think uh, this, this kind of uh, institution will completely disappear as long as it's useful for government finance. So far, right now, it's still useful. Right, so it's true, it's true our governments are complaining, but we shouldn't forget that uh, the ratings that they obtain are still too high, even after downgrading. I mean, as compared to private market, they should have much lower ratings. So in a way, the, the reproach what the one would have to make to rating agencies is that, that they are still overvaluing uh, government debt. But this is in the But it's, it's, it's a uh, 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 schizophrenic situation, because on the one hand, they have been accused, you've been too lax, and now, <laughs> Uh, they're being accused, oh, well, now you're too severe. And so so what's, uh, who, who, who is the judge here? And uh, the, the way politicians portray it, especially in France, but in other countries, the same thing, the way politicians portray them, uh, portray them as some kind of dictators of, of the market. But again, right, the, the, the fact is rating agencies are very lenient. If anything, they're very lenient. And what they express are just the basic economic constraints of scarcity. And you cannot just uh, produce as many savings as would be needed to finance uh, existing government debt at low interest rates. It's impossible. A lot, a lot of churches, including Catholic and Orthodox church, churches, consider that the current crisis is not only a financial one, but uh, especially a moral one. Is that a proof of their pragmatism, or there is real truth in, in, this, in these things? I think they're, they're, they're correct on this point, where I would add uh, a special note as an economist is to say, well, that the moral disposition, among other things, depends also on the institutional context. Right? Human beings do not act in a vacuum, right? uh, but they respond to incentives created by the environment. So it's true, right now we have, we have created in the past uh, 30 to 40 years, we have created a, a real culture of irresponsibility. And this culture of irresponsibility 
goes in hand with phenomena like excessive greed, uh, especially on the financial markets right now. Uh, and uh, this results to a large extent from the institutions that we have created, especially central banks that have uh, stabilized bank the banking industry, the commercial banking industry, and financial markets in general, and thus created right, the incentives to, be, to reduce their own precautions. Right? Banks have been reducing their, their equity positions and their, their liquidity, and they have taken very risky uh, investments, have made very risky investments ultimately because they could rely on the lender of last resort, or let's say the problem solver of last resort. Right? So the, the greed that we have right now, especially on financial markets, it's not only on financial markets, but also especially on financial markets, is the result of the institutional context that we've, we've created. It's not something that is a necessary, uh, necessary aspect of finance per se. If you had the central bank pump all the money into the economy, not through financial markets, but say, let's say through kindergartens. Right? I promise to you, within 10 years, we would have all greedy people within the economy that would be kindergartners. Right? There's nothing that has per se to do with finance. It has something to do with the incentives created by, well, you, you do not, you're no longer self-responsible. Uh, there's always this big brother behind you who would take care of all problems that you have and all the profits that you obtain are still for yourself. Heads win, tell you lose. Heads I win, tell you lose. Churches as institution, they don't have any responsibility in this. Literally, the world without God, without without uh, without uh, rationality, without uh, with more a lot a lot of relativity, mm -hmm. uh, we can see the the position of the churches regarding the abortion. The, mm -hmm. A lot of uh, any other problems, which uh, which promote the responsibility, you know, mm. in a lot of matters. Don't you think that? Well, what, what I what I what I see is that the churches have done uh, a lot of work, precisely in the good direction. What I what, but what I also say is that uh, all these efforts they have brought some fruit, but they are ultimately condemned to remain uh, well, not completely sterile, but somewhat sterile, as long as you do not attack the institutions that give in incentives for this kind of behavior. That, that's the problem. The, the, so they the basic problem the is the states have been too much in love with the state. That's the basic problem. Right, so the, there was a confrontation, was a big confrontation between church and state throughout the 19th century. Yeah. Right, and then it somewhat stopped after the church lost uh, some, some decisive battles at the beginning uh, of the 20th and uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, Kulturkampf in Germany, right? Bismarck trying to suppress especially the Catholic Church. And in France, you had the law of the separation between church and state, which practically boiled down to the solution that the state owned everything. The church uh, just owned the, the Holy Spirit in, in the individual hands. Now, that was a defeat, but rather than admitting defeat and say, okay, we have here a formidable adversary, a formidable enemy, and we need to resist them. The, church, the churches espoused a kind of a middle of the roadway and tried to cultivate amical relationships with the state and thus permitted the state to add up one institution after another that created those very incentives to immoral behavior that, that we decry today. I mean, you have got to see this. Why are, for example, why are uh, families, why are fertility rates dropping? One important reason is because we have uh, social security that guarantees uh, revenues into your old age and so on. So why should you care of having uh, and raising children, spending a lot of money there? Uh, and you have um, uh, health insurance for all kinds of behavior. So rather than uh, uh, choose prudent behavior and so on, have a family or maybe have no family. Uh, and you encourage drug use. You encourage uh, dangerous practices and homosexuality, uh, homosexuality and so on. Uh, and, and the bill is being footed by uh, the population at large. So it's, right, of course, it's always possible, and this is what's something that Pope uh, John Paul II has always stressed, it's always possible to resist, even if the incentives are contrary. But of course, yes, but given the present institutional environment, you almost need to be a saint in order to do this. Right? It's like, look, I mean, look, most men like women, 
it's like if you say, well, I mean, you're constantly showing whatever photos of naked women before them, so they're luring themselves in, in their rooms. I mean, how many men can resist? Uh, if this happens constantly, and they're not many, right? Or if you say, well, you get beer for free and and and, and vodka for free, or almost for free. How many men can resist having more than the, the one drink that is necessary to start the evening, right? We do this on a constant level. So we're creating all these incentives. Like from a moral point of view, we might say temptations. And then we expect that people only armed with the Holy Spirit resist. Right? And I say, yes, it's possible, but <laughs> unfortunately, it's not very likely. Okay. So we need, to, we need to attack those institutions. We need to change the institutions. Regarding this struggle between church and the state, uh, do you think it's a simple coincidence of or retaliatory measure the decision of Greece and also Italy, I think, to tax the properties of churches and the activity of so-called commercial activities of churches. Well, I, th I think that that's uh, that's just populism, right? The the, the government needs uh, money, needs well, revenue. Why not? Why not? Why not the rest of uh, the, ONG, because ONGs? Because Christianity, you know, uh, the Christian. Uh, Faith is at an all-time low in popularity, right? so Christians are easy targets right now because people think that well, uh, they've uh, done terrible things in the past, right? There was were the Crusades, and they've burned the witches, and so on. There was suppressing the free expression of sexuality and all these kinds of things, right? Were indoctrinating the poor children. So I mean, and, and then they they were greedy and. Uh, Got lots of land uh, everywhere in the country, so it's only justified now if they uh, if they pay. Right? So the church is unpopular, therefore it's an easy target for uh, expropriating or expropriation directly or indirectly through the state. Seventy years ago in Germany it was the same thing with the Jews, and right? so the Jews were easy targets, were an unpopular part of the uh, population. So you target Jews. Right? The rich are always an unpopular part of the uh, population. That's what we see right now in France. So Francois Hollande, the new president, proposes to tax the rich to a greater extent than before. It's an easy target. I think that there's, there might be other motivations at place, but I would say this is probably the main motivation right now, to target right, the church for greater contributions. Thank you, Mr. Kuzma. My pleasure. <laughs>